I'd like to kick it off um, with you, Ali. Right? We've seen the documentary. We've seen your journey somewhat and how everything started. But I, I just want to dial it back there just for a little bit, you know? In the beginning of the documentary itself, we see you experimenting and listening to your parents' records. Take us through that. What kind of music were you listening to? What was it that, you, that got you enticed into music first and foremost? I think for me, you know, I, I was seven years old when I came to America. Um, we left everything in Iran because of the revolution, and uh, I never went back. Um, and I had a hard time uh, with the language, with the customs. Like, I had a hard time um, fitting in, you know, with, with um, society, you know, and, and the American way of life. So I tended to be a withdrawn, introverted kid. And, um, you know, I was talking to, to a lot of people earlier how music for me was always like my escape yeah. from the reality that I was in. I didn't have a lot of prospects. I wasn't really interested in school. And, you know, being Persian, your parents want you to become a doctor, or a lawyer, or uh, an engineer. And if you're not picking one of those... Um, you know, not choosing one of those, then, then you know, you're going to be kind of a degenerate and your parents are going to disown you and, and make your life miserable. Um, so for me, I don't know, like, I, I, I just always gravitated towards music. For me, it was always, you know, that escape that, that I craved, that I needed. Um, uh, I wasn't a popular kid at school. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it, it led me to other people that were, you know, like-minded um, who also had you know similar backgrounds as me, being an immigrant um, in a foreign land, and um, you know we found each other and we found um, our voice uh, and our creative outlet through music. You know, in the beginning it was just appreciating and discovering new music, um, and then I got really interested uh, in how music was being made. Yeah, um, and I started to gravitate towards people that had equipment um, and, uh, you know, eventually started school bands and, and was always playing in bands after school. And one thing after another kind of led me down that specific musical path. Now, Temba, I see some parallels in your story, funny enough. And you also come from humble beginnings. Tell us a bit about how your family upbringing is or was and what led you into music as well. Might want to turn it on, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, also come from uh, parents that were originally staying in the rural areas of South Africa, namely Mpumalanga and Falskrest around KZN. They moved to um, the townships. Um, my mother in Ligazi, which is just out of uh, Mpumalanga. My dad, Davidson, which is a suburb uh, township just out of um, Johannesburg. So um, as being, as the first child, um, obviously like I was born in, in trying times, I would say. Um, and my first experience with music is that I wasn't, again, the popular kid in, in the school. I wasn't really an academic and I wasn't really a, like a, a, a person that was into sports, you know, like, and I think from a very young age, I'd already identified with myself that like, I like doing this and I don't like doing that. Even from playing with the other kids in the streets, like if they were playing soccer, I wouldn't be involved. But if they were playing like cars with like bricks and stuff, I'd, 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 I'd be in on that. Um, my parents sacrificed a lot to make sure that I went to a good school. And actually like I went to a school in Benoni where I was one of the first black kids in the school. So I grew up with Parents that live in the, in, in the township listening to whatever they listen to, my friends on the streets listening to whatever they listen to, and my friends from school listening to whatever they listen to. So my cool factor um, when I was growing up was that I, I, I was the kid that like had the cool music. So I was always like making sure that I knew that the back of the black box record, I knew who the singer was, who the artist was, who the label was, and like I knew all sorts of different music, so I had an eclectic taste, which is, if you listen to 
euphonics music yeah. in South Africa, you'll tell that like this is someone that grew up listening to a wide variety of, of everything. And um, I identified when I was very young that music is my thing and everyone came to me for, for music. Um, I remember I was the first kid in my circles to have the Snoop Dogg album in 1993, yeah. you know, and nobody had it. And, at, and in order for people to listen to the song back then, what did they have to do? Come to you. They had to come to me, you know. He had to, either had to come to you, come to your house, or like I'd sneak my Walkman into school and like yeah. during break let the other guys listen to to the album because like they it, like you couldn't find the music anywhere. So I just took like a serious um, liking to making sure that whatever music genre it was, I was at the forefront of it and I was like on top of it. I mean, some of my favorite music that I listen to till today is like the OJs, the Spinners, yeah. Huma Sigela, Stimela. Um, yeah. So Timba has quite a, a wide variety of music that he was listening to. And obviously also in the documentary itself, we kind of treated to see like how wide your, your taste in music was. What were some of the earliest stuff that you were listening to? Um, <clears throat> I mean, my name Dubfire is kind of inspired by a, a dub reggae song by uh, Lee Scratch Perry, who's like one of my favorite um, dub producers. Yeah. So I was heavily into reggae, especially the dub style. Um, hip hop, um, as you saw, I think Hachi was in the early part of yeah. um, the documentary, and you know he introduced me to a lot of reggae that I didn't know about, and uh, we kind of became a team for five years. Um, I was playing rare groove, acid jazz, uh, and, uh, and and reggae, and Hachi was like emceeing on top of you know the versions or the instrumentals that I was playing, um, and I had a really nice network with like acid jazz in the UK and and uh, Giant Step in New York. Uh, we were called Exodus uh, in DC. So that was a big part of you know, the, the early you know, evolution, uh, musical evolution that, that I, I, I you know, was a part of. Uh, I was very much into like industrial music, new yeah. wave. I didn't really come from disco, although I appreciated yeah. disco. Um, so uh, also, uh, yeah, I was heavily into punk because yeah. uh, in DC we had a lot of incredible punk bands like Fugazi, Minor Threat, Scream, Black Flag, uh, and I was going to punk shows. I basically like, you know, would sneak out of the house late at night, go downtown and yeah. see as many shows as I could and um, try to see as many, you know, DJs as I could as well. I was just so, you know, immersed in music culture um, and, and mostly the kind of music that was not being played on the radio. Yeah. Uh, so I was always, you know, initially I got into music from what was being played, you know, like, uh, you know, on commercial radio, terrestrial radio. Um, and then I started to dig deeper, dig below the surface, and, and, and I started to find more interesting things that spoke to me. Yeah. Now, for both of you, I think, obviously, you, you in, at an early age, you're immersed into music. You, you're trying to find the other thing. But a lot of people love music and you can get immersed in the world of music and you wanna, wanna, wanna hear different things. But there's gotta be that turning point where you're like, you know what, actually I wanna be a DJ. When did that happen for you? Like that first moment you're like, you know what, I actually wanna do this now. I was playing in, um, I think we talked about you playing house parties. Yeah, so I was playing, we have a lot of like... Commonalities, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, our trajectory is very similar. Plus you guys our love dressing, dressing in black too. Like, and and yeah. yeah, yeah. Look so, how we're sitting. It's <laughs> a problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was, you know, before I was old enough to play in clubs, before yeah. I was um, given an opportunity to play in clubs, I was just, um, you know, playing in house parties. Yeah. Uh, and the house parties started over, over the years to become you know, a bit more serious with a bit more production yeah. uh, until I outgrew the house parties and, and with a fake ID, I started to play in clubs. Yeah. Um, and I always played differently than anyone else in DC. And I had like a, an interesting name as well. Um, and I was also playing, I remember in school dances, yeah. you know, wow. um, the, the very early days of house music when yeah. a lot of people hadn't heard of it. And just one thing led to another. It was, it was you know, just persistence. Yeah. Um, never giving up. I, lo I love to piss people off. Yeah. I love to clear the dance floor and, and fill it again with my vibe yeah. and my groove. And over the years, I became more confident in, yeah. in um, the fact that um, I had maybe a unique 
musical perspective yeah. that others didn't have in DC. And that kind of gave me the, the, the drive, you know, to, to keep searching for that perfect sound, you know, and that perfect experience. Temba, you had quite a few moments where someone looking from the outside might have been like, yeah, that's the moment. Yeah. Like, I remember um, one of your very early mixes on um, Metro FM, where you could hear that you were playing all your, your tracks of vinyls, you know? And um, would you say that's the moment, or is it completely different? No, um, I think my moment was when I was 11 years old, um, and I had a cousin who went to Medunsa to go study to be a doctor. Yeah. And while he was that side, um, obviously, like, interacted with, like, people that were doing parties at his university, and he met this guy called Bongs, yeah. right? Um, and Bongs used to be the label manager at Galawa. So him and Bongs became friends. So when my cousin came back, um, he started doing street bashes. Yeah. Um, and through the connection with Bongs would bring like some of the early day Galawa artists like Soldier Tre, uh, Appleseed, um, Bongo Muffin, Boom Shaka would come. And I was too young to be, to be in the party, but yeah. like he'd basically like outside a four room house, um, they'd set up in the yard and then I'd have to sit like inside the house with the curtains open so that I could <laughs> see outside to see what was going on yeah. just to keep me away from the party. And for me, it was like, like this guy would play the song and Appleseed will chant over the song and people will have a reaction. Yeah. It like just didn't make sense to me that like, w what was it about anything that was going on here? And back then it wasn't even close to it being DJing. It was, yeah. they were literally just like, he'd play this song, stop, yo, 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 play the next song. And I started collecting all the music that he was playing and asking my cousin, what's this song? I want this song. What's that record? Can I get this record? Um, and I just started collecting like a lot of music. Um, when I was 14, um, a friend of mine from, from uh, school said, I must come DJ at his party. So um, like, you know, being a black kid in a white school, I, I didn't even know what DJing was, but obviously that this friend of mine, Michael, yeah. had experienced the world, experienced things, and he knew what DJing was. So I was like, I don't know what that is, but I'm gonna bring my music and I'll come play. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, that's what it is. Just bring your music and come play at my <laughs> sister's birthday party. Yeah. So I went and that was my first DJing experience, you know, yeah. um, like me playing personally. And again, it was like my vinyls, um, some CDs and cassettes. So I was also just like, press stop, play. And I saw the reaction of how people were reacting to every song. Like if you played this one, they all walked off. Yeah. You played this one, they all came back. You played this one, they jumped up and down. And I was like, this thing is powerful, whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Like, and I'm, I'm like a 14-year-old kid. I don't understand what it is. Yeah. But I was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, whatever yeah. it is. Um, and as time went on, like, school socials would start, started happening, like Valentine's Day discos and all of that. And I remember, like, one of the first ones that I went to was ENF and Sasha Martiningo yeah. from 5FM back in the day playing at one of those things. And I asked the school teacher that, like, listen, I don't want to be in the crowd. I want to be backstage standing there. And I want to see what these guys are doing. Yeah. You know, and I got the experience of doing that. So for me, it was always about being behind the scenes and like being the guy that makes the reaction. Yeah. You know, that was another moment. Then there was my moment of playing at Huzu, which is one of the biggest clubs in Johannesburg at the time. And that came at a time where the DJ, the spotlight wasn't ever on the DJ. You know, yeah. it was you sat in the corner there and played and you could see the people, but the people could never see you, you know? And for me, like being able to like, you know, mess with people's emotions, make them happy, make them smile, make them jump up and down, yeah. be able to turn down the volume and have them sing along without them knowing like who's, who's doing this? this, you know? Yeah. Um, so those are some of the moments. I mean, I remember I, I, I also got a residency at one of the Capellos in, in, in Joburg in Lone Hill. Yeah where because of the licenses, the DJ box was in the office, you know? So you literally were playing here, no one could see you, you couldn't see them. <laughs> and occasionally you'd open the door to check, yeah. you know, like, are people still dancing? So, like, for me, it's always been about the music, you the know? Music. Like, um, so we're gonna invite you guys, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, go I was gonna say, um, yeah, control, I think, was a big part of it. Yeah. Like, the fact that, 
you know, maybe I didn't have control over my life, yeah. you know, uh, over school or over personal uh, relationships or anything like that. But for, the, for that brief flash in time, yeah. I had full control, you know, and that was kind of an empowering yeah. feeling, you know. We're going to invite you guys to ask your questions later, so do keep them in mind. And we live in a digital world, so please uh, go on Twitter and uh, make some noise about Bridges for Music. Now, guys, the thing that's interesting that I'm catching, other than all the parallels, if we fast forward, would you agree that being a DJ, you, you are a bit of a control freak? You do have a bit of a God complex? Like, because obviously the music that you're making or the music that you're playing for that hour or two hours set, however long your, hour, your, your set is, you're in control of what happens next. How important is it for you, because you mentioned uh, for, for yourself, Tapfire, that you are kind of okay with the fact that if you start your set, you lose your crowd, you bring them back with your own sound. Temba, you were noticing what guys liked, so you kind of packaged the music in terms of what you, you knew would keep people there. As you grow, in, in your artistry, in, as, as your brand as well. What's more important for you? I mean, for me, before, you know, wanting to even control the crowd, I needed to, f to turn myself on. So I got into it for very selfish reasons. I wanted to feel that euphoria that you feel when you discover a new song or you know, you're, you're looking at, uh, across the dance floor and, and, and because you played, you know, a certain group of songs in a certain order and built up to this one song that you really wanted everyone to feel as much as you feel, you know, everyone's got their eyes closed. I lived for those moments, yeah. you know, those moments that felt like literally you were, you were uh, on drugs in a, in a, in a trance-like, you know, blissful kind of uh, state. So I was always chasing that high that I got from, um, you know, that feeling that, that those special moments throughout the night gave me. Uh, so um, everything else kind of happened around that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, for me, um, it's, it's, it's so weird, but like even from like early Kinfonic days, whether it's the just DJing or actually just making music, I was always like blown away by, by the fact that I could sit in a studio or in a room or my laptop or my computer and make a song and that one other human being would, would love it yeah. and would sing along to it. Like that for me was like the most mind blowing thing that like even till today, like yeah. I'll sit in the studio and I'll completely immerse myself with like what I think is cool. Yeah. I'll get up, I'll dance in the studio, I'll fist pump, I'll do whatever it, it, it is. And when I play that song, for somebody else, the fact that one other human being in the world loves a song, for me, was the driving factor. Because then I'd say, okay, cool, I'm going to try something else and yeah. see if I can get the same thing. You know, which is why if you listen to, like, euphonic stuff, it's very, like, eclectic. Like, my music is never, like, in one place. Because yeah. I'm always, like, if I could get this person to like this, what yeah. about what I can get that person to like? Or be blown away by who's going to come and to me and say... I love this, or yeah. I, I love that, or like this changed my life, or I sing along to this. So for me, it was always about the one other human being that yeah. was going to love what I was making in my solitude um, as much as I was loving it. So there was a stage in both of your careers where, Dabfai, you talk about euphoria, you were euphonic, <laughs> and both of you, in terms of when you look and define euphoria, it's about a pleasing sound and you're pleasing someone else. And you loved also playing music and building up to a place where we're all together, have a kumbaya moment in a sense. Also, you were also play wanting that music where you knew that someone also would sing along to it. Let's, let's, let's focus a bit on that phase of your guys' lives. And that would, I, I'd probably put it in the phases of deep dish. Yeah. Tell us a bit about how you guys came together. Um, because I mean, you were doing your own thing. You were quite defined. Your partner was doing his own thing. He was quite defined. How did you find that, that middle ground? For, for us, um, it was the constant, because he was a Leo and I'm an Aries, and we fought from day one. <laughs> um, in the beginning, there wasn't, we weren't that well established, so there wasn't so much at stake. Yeah. But 
as the years went on, I mean, we met and we were complete opposites. Yeah. Um, but where we, you know, where we were able to collaborate um, and where we met in the middle uh, after our arguments, that's where the magic of, of Deep Dish happened. Yeah. After so many years, that got a bit tiresome, yeah. you know, because we all evolve as, as people. We evolve in our, in our personal lives. We evolve as, uh, evolve as um, you know, uh, we evolve creatively, yeah. um, business-wise. Certain things that were important when we first started out start to take a back seat. Um, and um, over the years, you know, those things started to become more of the dynamic of Deep Dish. And it was yeah. a very unpleasant, kind of like a black cloud yeah. over, um, you know, uh, the whole project. And so one day, uh, you know, it wasn't one day. It was like many days of, yeah. of waking up in the morning and or not wanting to... Wake up, waking up in the morning and not wanting to get out of bed to Thank like you. face the day. Yeah. Um, you know, when I got to that point, I was like, this is not, you know, right. Something's wrong. You know, yeah. we were at the peak kind of of our success, but I was miserable. Yeah. He was miserable. And um, there was no other, for me, there was no other option yeah. but to stop right there, take a break from it, and re, you know, reset. And, and come at it, like go back. It sounds cliche to say that, go yeah. back to your roots. But yeah. in many ways, like when I met Sharam, I was very much in the alternative left field kind of guy. Yeah. And I really wanted to, to reconnect with that. You yeah. know, we reached the, the end of our creative cycle and it was time to move on to that next chapter. Um, it was very scary for me because I didn't know if I was going to be accepted into the techno community. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I knew, because I knew from having been in Deep Dish that if I follow my inner voice, if I'm true to myself, success, money, fame, all that stuff will eventually, you know, happen. The interesting part, though, is that, and one thing that none of us have experienced here, you won a Grammy, though, in the middle of all of that. Like, <laughs> how, do you, how do you put that into words, like... Just describe that for us. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm an immigrant, you know, and uh, not a very popular immigrant. I'm Persian. I'm Iranian, you know, like um, so to win that award for for our people, yeah. you know, for our communities. I think that was more important than anything else for me. You know, my mother. You know, it was, you know, all those years of, of her not sure about the career choice that I made and, you know, uh, all the late nights and travel and lack of sleep, everything like that. It, it came to that moment where it was like validation that, um, you know, I, 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 you know, she did a good job with me and, yeah. and I picked the right, um, you know, career path. Uh, so for me, it was, you know, I mean, the next day was a new day or whatever, yeah. but um, for that brief moment in time, I love to see how happy it made my, my family and also yeah. my, my community. So that's, that's the significance of it for me. It wasn't like a creative yeah. significance. <laughs> <laughs> Timba, there was literally a time where I remember switching on my radio. And um, actually, I lied. It wasn't even my radio. I was at Varsity at the time, and someone had given me a mix. And this mix started with um, tunes from KC and Jojo, as well as Jodeci and Acapella. And I remember listening to this mix for the, literally for 25 minutes with my jaw literally on the floor, like, what the hell is this guy doing? He's mashing up tunes from the 60s with House From Now. You guys were basically untouchable at the time. How did it feel to literally be on top of the world where the DJ freshers of this world are saying, this is the next big guy? Sure, that's a hard question to answer because I've never actually ever, even till this day, I don't see it like that. For me, it's always about like, when I'm sitting by myself, what I think about it, you know? And ir irrespective of what the next human being says or thinks or feels, like, a lot of people come to me and be like, yo, this is amazing. And I know that, like, shh, like I missed my cue point at that point. So yeah. <laughs> it wasn't actually that amazing, you know? So, like, I've always been, like, 
very headstrong like that. And for me, it, like it, my music thing has always been about being persistent and yeah. and and pushing and and um, making sure that like as many people as possible could hear what I was doing. Yeah. You know, like I was never involved in like bashing or like things that like I'm not interested in. I always knew that like this is me, this is what I like and this yeah. is what I'm going to promote. So I want as many people as possible to hear this. Um, the style of mixing, I don't think was really inspired by anyone, but mm. it was like, what songs do I like? And how can I make those songs make sense, like, make yeah. sense in, in a 25 minute mix, you know? Also, like having the diversity of how I grew up, it was, how can I make a mix that's going to make my dad think, damn, that's cool. Yeah. The white kids from my school think, damn, that's cool. And the black kids that I'm in the hood with think, damn, that's cool. So it was always like fusing like everything that was me and everything that I liked into, yeah. in, into one thing. So yeah, the next person thought like, this has never been done, what, what's going on here? But for me, it was like, this is the music that I like yeah. in a mix. So we've just, we've spoken with Dubfire around Deep Dish and the group and how you got out of that and how also there were amazing moments within that. So let's, let's not forget about that. You've been part of two crews. First, <laughs> first with Ken, um, Kent and yourself, and I think that's probably where the, the mega mixing genre was born in a sense. How was that and, and why did it last? So, um, again, like in, in, it, when I finished my trick and moved to Varsity, which basically meant I had to leave Benoni and go to school in Joburg, you know? Um, yes, it's all in like the same province, but like, Benoni is far from Joburg, you know. Um, I, again, like when I got to varsity, I didn't want to be here. You know, I yeah. didn't want to study accounting. I wanted all I wanted to do was make music and be a DJ. So I started gravitating towards everyone that was like either like in the events societies, in the audiovisual societies, and like figuring out like yo, how like this is what I do. How do I make music? How do we like how do we infuse what I do with 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 everyone else? Um, and at the time, this was like 2003, um, Kent was uh, playing music on uh, YFM. And one of my friends was like, no, like Kent actually comes to this varsity. And like everything stopped. I was like, I need to find this person because we are going to do stuff together, you know? I found him, we basically had the same pains and pressures because at the time, the only way you could be like, considered like one of the top DJs was if you had the music that all the top DJs were yeah. playing. And record shops like House Africa and Soul Candy were bringing in like 30 records of a sound at a time. Yeah. So if you didn't have the deep dish record, like forget it. Like, cause people want to go and listen to the deep dish record. So like being like a critical thinker and a strategist, I was like, we need to make our own music because yeah. that's what's going to set us apart. So we started making our own music, which is, how Ken Phonic was born from yeah. the stress of like, w w like he wants to get to the same place I want to get to, but we can't because everyone else, we don't, we don't have access to the records. And it literally, like I used to go to record shops, I used to hang out there three hours minimum a week in each record shop that was in Joburg. And I'd come and I'd say, listen, I've got the money to buy the record, why can't I buy it? And they're yeah. like, no, because it's not for you, it's kept for other people. So that frustration is actually what like made the birth of Ken Phonic because we were like, this is what we are going to do whether we're getting the support or getting the records, but like we're, we're, we're moving ahead. So we started making our own music mm -hmm. and literally like we'd finish making records at like five, six o'clock in the morning and I'd drive from wherever we were, we were and go knock at the window before like Fresh even knew who I was and knock on the window and be like, yo, I, like I've got this. Yeah. And eventually like he opened up and it's like, what? Like what's cool? Like I was like, I've got, we make music, like just try this out. And the first song that we actually ever gave him was um, the Kenphonic remix of Nsigi Mazwai's Orongo, which was like Huge. A, a smash in South Africa. So again, it was just like, I'd, like this is what I want to do. This is like, I didn't know yeah. that like there'd become a time where I'm like sitting on the same couch with Deep Dish. Like this was never like, uh, with Dub Fire, you know, yeah. this, was, this was never like <laughs> crazy ever thought, but it was just like, I know what I want to do. Yeah. All I want to do is play my music, the music yeah. that I like to as many people as possible. 
Now, picking up off your guys' way that you were trying to break through with music, and interestingly enough, it was through the remix, Ega Urongo, right? With Deep Dish, you guys, your breakthrough was through remixes as well, and it's kind of like your early claim to fame was taking music that other people had made and reprogramming it and making it your own. Would you say that's a segue, that's a way that you kind of get into the scene or that like you can break into the scene? Yeah, back then, we, we spent a lot more time in the studio than, than you know, like now. Now, um, you know, uh, and you would make money actually making music and releasing it or doing remixes. So you yeah. didn't have to be uh, on the road all the time. Um, and we were kind of known in those early days after the DeLacy remix for taking like, you know, R&B or pop songs and... Uh, and we were heavily influenced by like Masters of Work and yeah. like those Masters of Work dubs, yeah. um, you know, of, of R&B and pop artists on major labels, the double packs or the triple packs. And there was always like a really cool dub that, 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 that was, you know, uh, how they experimented. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, once we had the hit with DeLacy, we started to get a lot of interest from major labels wanting us to, to remix everything and anything. And we did that for a while. Some projects were very successful. Um, some were very creatively uh, with us, um, yeah. creatively important. Um, and everything was kind of um, helping us evolve, helping us grow as, as musicians. And um, after a while, we just started to lose interest with, with you know, the formula. Yeah. And um, we, we were always, you know, I mean, that's the thing I think with any artist or musician, you're always searching. Um, you're never satisfied, you know. I'm, I, I still think I suck, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm always searching for, you know, the perfect production technique or the perfect groove, the perfect mix down, the perfect set, you know, the perfect experience that I want to give to my audience. And, I, you know, it's, it's that strive for perfection, you know, that we'll never reach, that for me makes the journey uh, and the hard work uh, interesting. I think that um, you guys are pretty close. Later, later on, we'll play some of your timber, timber tunes as well as some new dubfire material. Really looking forward to hearing that. The one thing that I just want to hop on for a little bit before we jump into questions as well is the concept of persistence. Because I know that you, you, you mentioned that word and I was like, it's something that I really want to talk about, especially when you're in the entertainment industry, whether you're a DJ, whatever it is that you, you want to do, persistence is quite important. Um, in fact, when it, when, when it comes to persistence, I actually have a personal story when it comes to Timber, where um, you were still on 5FM, and um, he was doing My House, and I was a very new DJ in Cape Town, wanting to get my mix played on your show. And um, literally, every time you'd come to Cape Town, I'd chase him around to every single gig that he was playing to give him this disc. I think I gave you the same mix for like seven times before he actually played it. What, for you, Timber, you obviously now making the shift from euphonic, big brand that everybody knows, like revered. Everyone has an opinion on, on euphonic. You've now decided to switch, switch gears into Timber. I can imagine even for Dubfire, that must be, like he shared earlier, and it was a scary moment for him whether he would be accepted of the, about that. And I'd like us to talk about a little further about that. How is it feeling for you right now? Because you are, you are there now. And I feel like you're sitting on the couch, me and Dubfire are here to listen. So share. <laughs> um, you, know, uh, you know, like, obviously, like, Euphonic is what Euphonic is in South Africa. Um, and over the last, I mean, like, I've been going to Miami since 2009. So I'll tell you, like, in 2009, in South Africa, like, Euphonic was on radio, was on TV, platinum albums, playing at all the big festivals, touring. So this was like back in 2009. I went to Miami and I was like, damn, this thing is far bigger than anything I've, I've ever imagined, you know? Because in South Africa, like, yes, it's hard, but it's also quick and easy to hit rooftop if you're persistent and, like, focused and you're putting in the work. So I basically, like, saw what was going on in Miami in 2009 and I put the reset button and I was like, back home, it's great, but the world is far bigger than what you think and what you anticipate it is. And obviously because you're constantly locked into your surroundings, 
you know, you're like on the big radio stations, you're on the big TV channels, you're working for and with the big record labels. You, you, you start getting you start getting this complex of like, I've made it and I'm yeah. the biggest and I'm the best and like nothing can happen and no one can take it away. And that trip for Miami actually like changed like everything about the direction that I was going to go. Um, I've also been a person that like, I take a lot of risks, but I also take a lot of calculated risks, yeah. you know? So 2009 in Miami made me say, I need to critical mass my country, which is like hit rooftop in every single thing that's possible as a DJ and then like take on the world because then you know roughly like what you're doing. So over the last three, four years, I've been taking time like going overseas, going to conferences, going to festivals, events, following DJs around, sit in the corner and just listen, just listen, just consume. And one of the things that I learned throughout that experience was that the rest of the world has musical snobbery, whereas in South Africa, we're called the what nation? The what nation? The rainbow nation. Yeah. Because of our diversity, you know? So, like, it's the melting point of, like, there's so many different cultures, so many different sounds, so many different... When you turn on our radio, like, Justin Bieber will play just before a euphonic song, yeah. you know, which overseas is, like, not really, like, common practice. So I learned that, you know, like, if you want to play in the... In the, in, the, in the EDM scene, you need to play EDM and EDM only. Yeah. If you want to play in the techno scene, you need to play techno and techno only. Yeah. And um, like a, an, an example would be like uh, Calvin Harris, How Deep Is Your Love, yeah. is a defected record, like a defected record uh, song. song. Yeah, yeah. But defected, because of who they are, would never sign the song with Calvin Harris's name on it because of what Calvin Harris stands for. Yeah. So it was never about the song, but about what the artist and what he it's represents about. is. When you're in South Africa, it's a completely different story. Like, you can make anything and everything, play it wherever you want to play and get away with it. While we're still on that point, so I don't miss it. Mm. I don't know if Dubfire knows this, but Roadkill was the most commercial song. We came that thing when the song came out. Like, it was in mashups. We were mashing it up with Justin Bieber. Yeah. Um, it was a huge, huge song. But the interestingly, interestingly enough, at the exact parallel for yourself, you were trying to find acceptance into a world that you had left. How, how was that going for you? Yeah, I think Roadkill in many ways was, you know, a producer, you know, just coming out of Deep Dish who was scared and not sure of which direction he, he wanted to go in and which direction would, would be the right direction. Yeah. And Roadkill was the result of me trying to, you know, embrace and move in a more techno direction, but also not completely alienate, you know, my fan base. Yeah. So in those early years, um, all the music that I was making, you know, and we just released a, a retrospective album, so you can kind of trace the musical evolution uh, yeah. of, of my solo career. Um, that was me trying to still appeal to everyone, but also come at it with, a, with an edgier, um, kind of raw that. kind of sound. You know, I was you know, very unhappy the last five years when I was in Deep Dish, and, and I had a lot of ideas that weren't necessarily appropriate for, for Deep Dish, because you know, our project, my project with Sharam, was always like a, a compromise. It was a shared vision. And um, sometimes I won, and sometimes he won. Um, but it was always a battle. Yeah. And after a while, I got tired of fighting. And so uh, Roadkill represented, you know, that, that new way forward. Um, and that, you know, was exciting when, when, I, when I saw that, like, guys like Tiesto were playing it, and Richie Houghton was playing it, and everyone in between, and, and how it resonated with everybody to the point where like Armin Van Buren signed it for his label in Tool Room in the UK, which was like a mainly house uh, label, UK house label, they signed it as well. Yeah. So I, I knew I was on, you know, I, I don't want to say the right path, but some new path forward, and that was exciting to me. And I knew I, I still had to chip away at um, who I wanted to, to become uh, and, and, and really mold myself in in the career that I'd really always saw myself as having, you know. 
I think that your persistence did get tested. You, in, in the documentary, there's even a story about how you had to pay to play at, gig, at some gigs. Yeah, of course you have to do that. Um, and, you know, we were talking about I don't know, you gave somebody, f or you gave, you gave him yeah. your track five times. Seven times. Seven times. Yeah, I, I, seven. Yeah. Got to be specific, seven. Yeah, <laughs> like we, you know, I think Ribcage was, was discussed in the documentary. I gave that track five times to Loco Dice. Wow. We were good friends. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he was starting a record label. And um, I gave it to a lot of people in the techno community. And nobody was really interested and nobody took me seriously, even friends, you know, yeah. people that I was friends with. Um, and it was funny because <laughs> I, I remember when it finally hit him was the strangest place, and we don't talk about it in, in the documentary, but uh, I, I was doing a, a CD release party for the Global Underground, solo yeah. Global Underground record that I did, and I thought it'd be funny to, to do it in a strip club in New York. <laughs> Um, because the press, you know, when you invite them somewhere, they, they've pretty much been everywhere and, and they're not really, you know, interested unless it's like a unique location. So we did it in a strip club and Dice was living in, in New York at the time with Martin Butrick and he came and I played it. Uh, and he was like, oh my God, what, what is, he came up, he's like, what is this track? I'm like, it's the track that I gave you five, five times, times, but <laughs> you, you just ignored it or, you know. Of course, he made excuses. Uh, I didn't hear it, didn't get to me, blah, 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 blah. But I think he heard it and he just wasn't convinced. Yeah. Um, and it took hearing it in, in that context in, in my set um, that, that made him, you know, uh, you know appreciate it for, for what it was. So I think it's persistence, but yeah. persistence, you know, there's a difference with people who are annoying, <laughs> yeah. persistently annoying, and, and just having the right pers persistence. So I think you have to have a bit of grace yes. and a bit of um, self-restraint with how persistent you are. At the same time, you have your agenda, you have your goals that yeah. you're trying to reach and you have to try to be somewhat persistent um, I, and never I, give up. Because I bought him a lot of tequilas. Right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> like similarly to what um, Ellie's talking about, I mean, um, how I built my relationship with a lot of the DJs in South Africa was that um, while I was in high school, I, I did business economics as one of my subjects and they spoke about a SWOT analysis where like your strengths and weaknesses and your opportunities. So I literally like took every DJ that I thought mattered and I put them on a table and I was like, cool, Fresh, Oskido, Vinny, um, Masters at Work, Mbuso. And then I said, cool, like what does this person do that makes him successful. And I ticked it, like wrote all the things. And then I came up that like, okay, cool. So in South Africa, to be a known DJ, you need to either be playing the right music, making music on radio, on TV, and throwing your own events. And then what I started doing was that like, I'd go to those people in their spaces. You know, like I'd go to a fresh show and stand in the front and just say, hi, how are you, are you cool, sweet? And, and leave them alone and never say, like, I've got this record that you want to listen to. So by the time um, I started asking for anything was when he'd walk into the room and be like, hey, are you cool? You know, now I've, he knows who I am, even if he doesn't know my name. But, like, I put myself in those spaces and I made sure that I was in the right places at the right time, which is what I'm doing now with, with Temba, you know, like, a lot of people like think, ah, oh, Euphonics made it, whatever, whatever. I'm going to shows, paying money, walking in, standing at the back, listening, finding out from the bouncer to the lady that's sweeping to the ticket guy, like, like who's who here, who does what, you know, and building it slowly like that, you know, because I, I hear what he's saying, man, like persistence is one thing, but annoyance is another, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, the, very important. I used to, um, from 2004 to when I first... I think played Cocoon, it was 2009. I was in Ibiza every summer, um, staying for two, three months, and just hanging out, just showing. Of course, I wanted to be the DJ up there playing the music that I really believed in, that I felt like wasn't being made, and, and you know, the DJs weren't you know, playing the way I thought you could play in, yeah. in that club. And I think it's very important to, to be there, be present 
you know, um, at all the places that, that you aspire to, to perform in or um, you just surround yourself with people that you respect because you, yeah. you are a product of your environment. So I immersed myself in that scene for many, many years and I was patient because I know how long, these days everybody um, wants kind of a fast track to yeah. success and fame, but I came from, from the very early kind of you know, evolutionary uh, era of, uh, of house music and I knew that you, know, you had to pay your dues, you had to be pers persistent. Awesome. Um, yeah, because I think a, a thing that a lot of people miss is um, like, how, like how would you describe yourself as a DJ, producer and, and what? Me? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how many of you guys here produce? Cool. How many of you guys DJ? So, yeah. I'm a DJ. I'm a producer. Yeah. Ellie DJs, he produces. The point that I'm trying to put across here is that we're all at different levels and like different parts of the journey in our own lives but yeah. the blanket is that you're a DJ you're a producer you know so there's no like hierarchy or like it's you know it's just you're DJing at a specific level right now and you're producing at a specific level right now but when the powers that be whatever that is says everyone that's a DJ stand up in the room we're all going to stand up yeah. you know what I'm saying so it's like just push forward, you know, because we were all yeah, like the and I same think it's, thing. I think it's important to, you know, some people are just really great producers and others are great DJs and, and you don't have to be everything. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of people trying to force um, that dynamic, you know, um, people that shouldn't be making music, releasing one record a month, you know, on Beatport because they just want to see it charted. Uh, and what they're doing is they're saturating the market with really bad, mediocre music. Um, I think, I think it's, 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 it's important to, to understand your role, yeah. understand where you fit in. You know, if you're a kick, you know, you're a kick-ass DJ, then stick to DJing yeah. and make your mark that way. Um, if things aren't really working out with you in the studio. And, you know, the other thing is don't be afraid to collaborate. Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, collaboration is underrated. If your skills are, you know, immaculate as a, as a DJ um, and unique, then find, like, a, a producer, yeah. you know, that wants to not be a DJ and wants to sit in the studio and, and, and together create a unique sound, you know, um, and that dynamic between DJ, you know, person that has the one foot on the dance floor and one foot kind of in the studio. Yeah. Um, that, that's where a lot of magic can, can, can happen, happen. In, in that kind of collaboration. Yeah. Now, I'd like you guys to prep your questions, plus uh, Temba, the reason why I was reaching over here. Uh, not ready. Oh, is it not ready? Not yet. Can you play from that? Um, I, didn't, I didn't bring it. Well, you, guys, you guys didn't bring any music? Okay, we brought some music. Okay, cool. What's this? This. Okay, wait, hold on. Let's put this at the back of the CDJ. No, no, no. It's for the mixer. Yeah, man, because, I mean, like, I spoke to a, an artist friend of mine, and yeah. he was basically saying that, you know, with him, with his art, he paints and draws, and he was saying that, like, the music, I mean, the, the art that you let people see is as important as the art you don't let people see. You know, so I, I took that and I adapted it to my music career, that... Yeah. The music you make and release is as important as the music you don't release. You know, so like that's to that point of that guy that's dropping a, a, a tune for every single month for the for, for the sake for the sake of it. Like rather drop like music that's like super iconic that like you know that you even when you're fifty you'll be able to stand behind and say yeah, yeah like I made this and I love this. You know. Yeah, you know, something to think about is like once you put something out there, once it's released, it's no longer yours. You know, it's always going to be there. And um, you have to think about like what kind of legacy, you know, do I want to leave behind? You know, yeah. how do I want to be viewed, you know, by the body of work? Because you're not going to be around. We're all going to die one day, you know, but our work hopefully will, will, will live on. And so you really should think about like the, you know, how you want to be remembered. Um, the, and that, that's become mm -hmm. much more important in my life 
as I've gotten older. You know, I don't worry about deadlines. I don't worry about, um, you know, I get a lot of requests for remixes and stuff, and I only want to work on projects that I feel like I can do something interesting with for the artist and for myself. Yeah. Because I care about now, you know, the, the work, the body of work that I want to leave behind. Talking about legacy, are any, either of you involved in anything else other than DJing? Like, because uh, now we live in a There's world There's no where, time. <laughs> <laughs> we live in a world where, obviously, the DJ is the brand, it becomes the business, but are, are there any other business interests that you guys are into? I mean, I have a, I have a record label. It takes up a, a lot of my time. Um, I'm developing an app. Uh, you know, Carl Cox was saying in the documentary, that everyone's always coming to me for you know, recommendations just because I yeah. travel yeah. constantly and, and I'm a fan of gastronomy and things like that. So developing a, you know, a, like, kind of a lifestyle and culture app yeah. um, with curated content. Um, but there really isn't, uh, I mean, I'm doing like close to 150 shows a year and you add the travel time and, and the fact that you have to sleep and answer your emails and go to the gym and eat see your family there's there's not That's enough hours in the day yeah. to, to do everything that you want to do Timber um, you know like uh, I, I now play house and buy house um, I'm in the property business um, but also like within the music space like I'm so passionate about helping other people yeah. you know but like the people that I help are those that you can see that like this person's pushing on his persistent and all he needs is just like that platform to like take him into the yeah. next um, phase. Because I think also like we, we're in South Africa, which is, you know, like I have the privilege of traveling and seeing what happens in the rest of the world, but we're in a country where we're literally, everyone is sitting waiting for my mother, my school teacher, the government, my priest, my friends to do something for me and doesn't actually want to get up and say, like, I'm going to take charge of my own life. Yeah. You know, so what's it called again when you just expect things to happen? Entitlement. Uh, yeah, a sense you, everyone's got a sense of entitlement, you know. So for me, like, I'm, like, the guys that are putting in the effort, that are yeah. bringing seven mixes, that are, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> those are the people that, like, you yeah. can see that, like, this person just deserves to, like, just deserves the extra uh, push. I mean, like, he must tell you how he got onto 5FM, you yeah. know, like, it's like, who deserves this thing? Like, who, who needs the push? Who's putting in the work? Who's, like, persistently going at it and chugging away, you know? Like, those are the people that, yeah. like, need the help because if they've got that work ethic, they'll be able to help everyone else behind them. And for me, like, one of my, the important things for me, man, is to, um, starting off with South Africa, yeah. is to leave the music scene a better place. Like, I don't want people to say, yeah, the scene's fucked and Euphonic was one of the people that like helped us get there, you know? Yeah. So like the legacy for me is important, man, which is why like being a part of like something like Bridges for Music, which is not just about today, it's yeah. about when we're all dead and gone, like how is the scene? You know, that's important. Yeah, and I, I think none of us would be here today if it wasn't for others that, you know, saw something in us that, yeah. that um, you know, forced them to take notice and, and help us along the way. I mean, we had guys like Danny Teneglia and, and, and many, many others. And as I age, uh, as we become more successful, you feel a sense of duty, yeah. you know, to, to give back to, um, you know, that young artist that's, you know, you can see how they're dreaming about doing what you're doing. You know, sometimes it's easy to take for granted how lucky we are and, and how privileged we are to be, you know, constantly working and, and touring. Um, and you see how hungry certain, you know, young DJs, you know, send you music uh, all, all around the world are. And if you, if you can find that, that spark that, that, you know, you feel they, they have that, that you had when you were their age, you feel a sense of um, duty and a sense of pride if you can, you know, help them achieve, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their dreams, you know. Gents, it's... Amazing speaking to you, but I don't want to be selfish. Um, does anyone have any questions? We'll take a few questions. Portia, do you want to jump first? Go for it. Okay. Um, so, who is your f best female producer in this scene? 
Favorite female producer? Yeah. Good question. Uh, <laughs> fuck. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, you know, I think I don't view things in male or female. Um, I was watching uh, something the other day on YouTube. Jerry Seinfeld was being asked about, you know, male comedians versus, you know, female comedians. And he was like, look, I, you know, that's for someone else to dissect and explore. I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in funny. Like, are you funny or are you not? You know, and I'm the same way with, with, with music. I, you know, I, I don't care who's making it uh, as long as it moves me. Um, you know, of course there's incredible female talent out there making music, you know, especially in, in alternative music, you know, pop, rock, things like that. So for me, um, yeah, I'm not really even paying attention to, to who's making it. I'm just like listening to that. Yeah, you know? I, like um, I, don't, I don't have a favorite female producer. Um, and you know, like one of the things that I've learned like on this path and this journey is that like when you speak to people or interact with people to try and always understand where they're coming from and why they would ask that question. Yes. You know, and I understand that you come from South Africa, which part of an accolade in South Africa is still like, I'm the first black guy to, yeah. I'm the first female D to, you know what I'm saying? So like, I don't know, but I view things the same as Ali. It, for me, it doesn't matter. Like I'm very close friends with Zintle, not because she's an amazing female DJ, but because she's an amazing DJ. You know, like that part of it doesn't matter for me. You know, like yeah, yeah. we're in a country where it's still like hashtag black excellence. Yeah. When it's like, are you good or are you not? Yeah. You know, yeah. th and that's what it should all be on, you know? And it's also just unfortunate that like a lot of female producers don't, you know, like. I think right now you're seeing an an incredible explosion of female DJ talent, you know. Um, and I, I look at a DJ as a DJ, you know, are they good, do they move me or whatever, but you're, you know, people like Amelie Lenz, Charlotte DeWitt, you know, uh, Heidi, uh, Nastia, um, you know, I, yeah, Mai Jane Cole, there's yeah. so many. And I'm and Nicole Mudaber, who I play back to back with a lot. Um, it transcends with, with me, it transcends um, sex, race, you know, you name it, um, sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. It's like, yeah. if, if, if you're feeling the music, um, if, if, if the artist is genuine, um, and if you can sense that, um, that's someone I, I want in my circle. Yeah, I think look up um, Black Madonna. She's like... Black Madonna, yeah. Yeah, probably like one of the most well-known female DJs, and she's like, she's a powerhouse, you know? when you listen to her speak and the things she says and the things she's done, she, like, look her up. And, I, yeah, like, it's, are you a good DJ before are you female? Thank you, Portia. Let's take our second question there at the back of the room. What's up, yeah. Okay, go for it, brother. Um, going back to the beginning of your career, how was it like when your parents finally saw the potential you saw in yourself? Especially looking at steering away from academics and going to your creative space. How was that like? I mean, it was, re it was really hard for a while because they, they weren't seeing what I was seeing. They, they, they didn't agree in the, in the direction that I wanted to go in. I, I sucked at school. I was terrible. Um, I spent my days in school, like, you know, drawing. Like, literally, I, I would draw record covers with my name on it, <laughs> draw the artwork, write, like, the credits, like, written and produced by, mixed and engineered by, you know, made up a fake record label. So I was really, like, you know, role-playing, I guess, in some ways. And, and, you know, if I wasn't a dreamer, I wouldn't... And I'm still a dreamer, you know. I think um, before you do anything, you have to, like, dream it. If you can dream it, if you can see yourself doing it, um, then it's a question of, okay, I'm here, and I want to go there. How do I do that? So then you do the work. That's when the work comes in. And I think with my parents, they started to accept... I mean, I was... I still had a day job <laughs> when we were remixing Janet Jackson for AM, PM, you know, um, because I wasn't sure if this was the right career choice. Uh, and then 
one day because I was late so many times and my parents were still not convinced, but I was late so much at work because I would work all day and then you know, drive an hour to my friend's studio and work all night and then go into work the, day, the next day. And after a while, you know, um, all the you know, consecutive nights of no sleep catches up to you and you're late for work. So I was late too many times and um, I had to make a choice. It started to become a problem and, and I said, okay, fuck it, I'm, I'm gonna be a <laughs> full-time <laughs> DJ. And I was like scared and I didn't know if I was gonna be successful, but I, I, you know, I still had a lot of passion, a lot of uh, hunger and drive. Yeah, man, we come from a country where, like, apartheid isn't even, like, 30 years, like, you know? So you just need to understand that your parents, it's not that they don't want you to be happy or don't want you to do it. It's just with how they grew up and the things that they fear and the things that make them have sleepless nights are the things that you have to put them at ease with, you know? So every parent wants to see their kid be successful, wants to see their kid do well, so take the onus on yourself to like know what makes my parents uneasy and understand that and then work towards making sure that like the things that make them uneasy, you've made them understand that like, okay, he's going to be okay. Because I think once my parents, I'm like, I got kicked out of home when I was 20 because I basically, what I, I, I mean, like I started DJing um, and then I was making enough to be able to pay my own varsity fees. And I said to my dad, listen, don't worry about next year's varsity fees. I'll pay for them, you know? Then the year after that, um, six months into the year, I was like, I'm stopping the school thing, you know, because I want to go focus on something else. And I got kicked out of house because my dad was like, which means someone that isn't educated dies like a dog, you know? So, like, now That's you... hard. Yeah. So, <laughs> so now you grow up with, like, that thing is still here. Like, so for me, like, I dropped out of varsity, but I didn't stop learning. So don't confuse education and schooling. Like they, those are two different things. Like constantly educate yourself and be at the pursuit of knowledge because um, you're going to need it for whatever else it is that you decide you want to do with your life. If it's music, then like, hey, it's 2018. You can sit all day, every day and learn how to produce from watching YouTube videos, you know? Uh, so there's too much information that's accessible to us. But yeah, put the people that, your parents, because they matter, put them at ease. Because nobody ever, like, I don't think you can surely, like, with positivity say, you knew this was going to happen, you know? It was all no, a risk, I, I, yeah. you know? So, like, yeah, take the risk, but, like, also put, make sure that you're putting in the hard work. You know, like, we sit all the time with guys that say, um, yeah, man, I want to be a DJ, man. Then you're like, okay, cool, so... What are you doing? No, man, can I, can, can I get headphones? And you're like, no, dog. Like, you know, if you want to be a DJ, say to me, listen, I'm, I'm a DJ. I'm playing free gigs seven days a week at this place. I just need someone to put me on. That's someone that's like, I'm already in the motion. I'm doing this thing. Not like now I must go and figure out where I can get you headphones because you haven't even started your career. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think, uh, you know, resident DJs are really, really crucial and important. Um, you know, DJs who play, who represent the sound of a particular club, you know, a club that, that's bringing in international talent. You know, there's a lot of uh, resident DJs who have shot to stardom because, um, you know, one of us who's coming and playing, you know, we go for, you know, to, to check the vibe out a couple of hours before we have to play and we're checking the other DJ and we're, we're saying, wow, this guy's really good. Hey, I, I kind of want to bring him on the road with me. Um, or if he's making music, I want to hear his track. So, you know, as a resident DJ, you have a lot of uh, power and um, you're putting yourself like in the right, you know, mix of people and in the right conditions to get noticed. In the interest of time, okay. we're going to take one more question. Valentino, you're my boss here. Two more questions. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Go for it, brother. <laughs> okay, I want to do the mic is here. Um, how did you come to that concept? Was it like the hyper show? Like that show? Oh, the live show. Uh, that was a, a great example of, of dreaming about doing something. For years, I wanted to, you know, do a live show. Um, but I had to wait until 
I had enough material as a solo artist to be able to put it together. And so um, I also felt like, you know, in, in presenting the live show, it would be one hour of, of only my own music um, presented in a, in a unique way. And it would be a, a good kind of uh, footnote or ending to the first decade of my, my career. So, you know, that was the easy part, thinking about the concept and, and um, realizing that I wanted to do this. The hard part was, was figuring out how to do it. And I was talking to you and, and a few others who asked me about it uh, earlier. It was really, you know, financially <laughs> a disaster for me um, in putting it together. But in the end, there's nothing more satisfying than having an idea and seeing it through to the end. I can't tell you that feeling that I had with my crew um, because we'd worked on it for about a year when you know, we were doing a test show in Budapest and we had a really shitty rehearsal space. You couldn't really tell what the show was gonna look like uh, when we were rehearsing it. And when we got to sound check and you know, everything went up on stage and, and we, we fired it all up and we, and we saw the fruits of our labor right there. That was the most incredible feeling in the world. So I, I, you know, despite all the hardships that, that got to that point, uh, I, I wouldn't have changed the thing. And I learned a lot about you know, what not to do as much as I learned about what, what to do. I, know I hope I answered your question, I don't know. So I know everyone has questions, but we're gonna take the last one now, because this is not parliament. Two, two, two more, I have one question. <laughs> okay, cool. I don't know if you know, Okay, Siba has a question. He's going to rub it up. Um, I don't know if you guys know that there is a South African sound that is taking the world by storm. Calm. And I want you guys to, or someone in the audience, to explain to Ali what... He, um, he did, actually. Yeah, <laughs> Demba did. Yeah, back there when, when everyone was watching a documentary. And he played me something on Spotify, which sounded wicked. I mean, immediately to me, it, it, it sounded like, um, you know, like uh, that Masters of Work track, Work. It was like very yeah. kind of raw and full of energy. So I it played had him, an Afro I played him Omunye, yeah. which is what he's referring to. Of course, you played him that. <laughs> <laughs> Who did that song? Uh, it's a good, they're actually they're playing at Sona with Diplo. It's guys called Destruction Boys. Yeah, that was wicked. Yeah, I like that. So, <laughs> Tema, next time you are at ADE, at ADE or IMS, and somebody comes and says, "Hey, I've heard this cool thing in South Africa called Kom," <laughs> how do you explain it? What is that? So, I mean, I'm like the way I explained it to, to Ellie is that it's like South, Af it's, it's South African. That's the only way to put it. It's, it's South African sounds, uh, drum patterns fused with electronic sounds influenced by like sampling either from like some of the stuff from like hip hop songs, like yeah. sampling and also like electro, you know, and just how... But it's also very raw, and the guys that like are producing this stuff are like all self-taught. So it's not guys that are like on YouTube learning how to side chain or how to. I mean, like the yeah, like like a guy that is is a taught producer will never do that. Yeah. you know what I'm saying. So like it's the one sound that's like loudly and, and proudly South African. And interestingly enough, there's been a huge debate about which part of the country it comes from. But it actually was born right here in Langa. No way. Yeah. From Langa. If wow. you guys remember ooh, DJ Pura, those were the first earliest remnants of Kom, actually. Yeah. Pura's the guy that moved to PE, hey? Yeah, he moved to PE for a bit. That was the first remnants of Kom that I can remember. Yeah, and I, and I think the most interesting things can happen when you're limited. You don't need a lot of technology. I mean, when I was learning how to DJ, I didn't even have a 1200 turntable. Yeah. I couldn't afford one. I had one regular Techniques turntable that had no pitch control. It was like a basic one that you could buy in a you know, typical hi-fi yeah. store. Um, and you know, I don't think I ever owned <laughs> there were 1200s. And, and, you know, and you know that the, 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 the biggest test for, for go music, especially like being South African, like let's not lie, like everyone tell the truth. Like the first time you heard Gorm, did you like it? No. no you see? But the guys that were making it were persistent. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, they were persistent. Yeah. Same as techno. <laughs> yeah. Same, yeah. same as techno. Let's take the last question for the night. Yeah. Um, last question. 
So you guys both have been to Langa, right? And I'm sure you guys are seeing what's happening around with the school and the environment and the people. The people are here are people based from Langa. So uh, through your experience and being here, what do you guys, how do you guys feel that the school could be used to benefit people? Because at the end of the day, all the people are here. They're trying to make something out of their music. And how, how do you, what, what suggestions do you guys have for the people sitting here? Like us, um, if, you got, if you had to start up your career in Langa, what platforms would you use? How would you utilize the opportunities that we're getting, like Bridges for Music, and, and try to make something out of yourself? Thank you. I mean, yeah, and I, I, I had, I told Valentino this uh, right after we, we came back from our little tour. I had the most incredible cultural experience that I think I've ever had recently, um, and especially in, in South Africa when we did a tour of the, the neighborhood. Um, met a lot of interesting people. Um, and, and you know learned a lot about you know the history of the township and you know how, how it evolved um, and and I didn't know that the style of music Guam is, is from here and that's like really you know Im important to know I think um, and it's it's really amazing that you have bridges doing this because it gives the community hope and it gives them a means you know to realize their dreams I bet you know, there's so many dreamers in, in, in this neighborhood who needed some sort of a break, and this is, this is the break. And what they have to do now is they have to put in the work and, and show up and, and learn. You know, education is a big part of it. And um, not just, you know, decide that they want to become a DJ because they're chasing, like, money or fame or whatever. Realizing that um, there, there's a lot that goes behind it. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of really talented people that without, without whom um, an artist would, would never, um, you know, have, you know, risen to a certain level of fame or have the kind of longevity that, that we've enjoyed. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot to it, and I think this school um, and the fact that it's here is a beacon of light for, for the whole neighborhood. Yeah, man, I mean, if this was back in 2003 and I was thinking of dropping out of varsity, this is where I would have come because this is the place that I would have wanted to be. Like this, the concept, the, like what Bridges is doing, everything about it as a creative, as someone that wants to be in the music industry, as, you know, like as someone that wants to take inspiration from like the world, this is like amazing, man. And also just how the curriculum is set up that it's 40% music, 40% um, transferable skills and 20% life skills like that. Like this is where I want to come and study, you know? Like, so yeah, if you're a young DJ and your parents wanna kick you out of home and don't want you to study music, <laughs> come like here. come here, yeah. you know, this is the place. Timber. Dubfire, guys, thank you so much. I think this, we owe the guys a round of applause at least.